Um, <clears throat> Sri Nayanananda Thakur doesn't tell us where this comes from. He just there's he just says there's a nice Sanskrit verse that goes like this. Jaladhara Sashi Varna Govavi Shokishoro Sahacharaga Vrkana Vrindai Krida Mana Vrajesha Natavara Jita Vesha Lila Pitam Bharatya Jagata Jagana Hetu Lama Krishna Natosmi So this is in the, what do you call it in Sanskrit? Dual? Jaladhara Sashi Varna Hmm? Oh. Yes. It's for two. Yes. It indicates two. So they have singular, they have plural, but they also have something in between, which is just two, a pair. So he says, this is Dashara Sutta Prabhu, my friend Dashara Sutta's translation. The pair of complexions, uh, the pair with complexions like a rain cloud and the moon, Jaladhara Sashivarna, I think I explained that before. Jaladhara, the rain cloud, because it holds water, and Shashi Varna, the color of the moon. Akridamana Rajesha, they're addressed, um, oops, wrong. wrong yeah. Gopavesha Kishora, they're young boys dressed like cowherds. Um, Sacharagana Brindai, Akridamana Rajesha, uh, these two are engaged in sporting in the assembly of their friends, and they're the lords of Vraja. Natabhara Jita Vesha Nila Pitam Bharatyao. Their dress eclipses the dress of the best of dancers, and they're fond of wearing blue and yellow garments. Nilambar and Pitambar. And Jogata Jananehe to Ram Krishna Natosmi. That pair, who is the source of all living entities in the universe, I bow to that pair, known as Ram and Krishna. So here we are again. And with that business out of the way, the old business, um, I, I think I need to start by um, apologizing. If anyone was paying attention to last year's classes, I apparently ended with what I'm going to start with tonight, the uh, very beginning of Madhuri Um I think what I had in mind last year was beginning a series moving us through Madhuri Um But I had a different idea to do with these other two classes tonight. Um, there's a project I'm working on and it reveals in some interesting ways the glory, the power of bhakti. Yes. And uh, I think some of the things that we'll see, um, we'll find are appropriate uh, to what we've been, what we witnessed especially this morning um, when we um, brought some new folks more fully into our what you are into our family. We're family folks. Rajabhasis are family folks. Sannyasis kind of stand out as weirdos. <laughs> That's okay with us. We don't mind. Um, there, are, uh, I want to. Um, I want to use this today, I want to use it in a different way from what I intended last year. I wasn't able to listen to the, when I realized last night as I was trying to fall asleep that, wait a minute, didn't you end up with the beginning of, of Madhuri Gadamani last night? And I pulled out my external hard drive, which Krishna was kind enough to remind me to bring. He made me write it on my list to check off before I um, closed, zipped, uh, was closed the, zipped the uh, bag shut before we left for the airport. And I went through and I looked at the classes and sure enough there was one for Monday, there was one for Tuesday, there was one for Wednesday, there was not one for the 11th, there was not one for Thursday. But at the beginning of Wednesdays I mentioned, because I'd been talking about some um, verses 
uh, in the 14th chapter of the, uh, of, of the 11th canto of the Bhagavatam. Now, tomorrow night, I want to come back to those verses as well, but also um, from a different angle, attack them from a different angle, explore them from a different angle is probably a better way to think of it. Um, and, uh, and it works, it works together with what I want to do tonight. Tonight is kind of laying the back, I think laying um, a kind of a foundation for what I want um, to do tomorrow night. And tomorrow, for, you know, won't, there, won't be, there won't be a lot of surprises for some of us. There may be some surprises for some of us. Um, but in any case, I'm just going to have fun sharing it, and you're going to have to put up with it unless you can find something else to do. <laughs> unless you can get an excuse from your mom. Um, so I do want to do that. I want to start um, again with the beginning of Madhurya Kadavani. Um, uh, the first section that explores um, the nature of bhakti before uh, Vishwanath Shukravarti Thakur begins actually discussing the different stages uh, of progress in bhakti for the practitioner. So um, this is uh, it's, it, it becomes a rather intricate uh, discussion in some places because um, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur has an inclination to argue things out threadbare, to explore every argument. And I'm not going to follow all those threads and shred them. Um, I'm going to kind of um, abbreviate some of them and move on. Um, because our time is limited. And it can be, um, uh, well, it's, easy, it's easier for some people to follow orally and other, easier for others to follow in, um, you know, by reading it. Um, but uh, it is kind of interesting, but it leads up to the, it all leads up to the conclusion that we'll arrive at um, at the end of our discussion tonight. So after offering obeisances to Rupa Goswami, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur makes an assertion. Um, well, he begins by asserting Krishna's absolute independence. And he says, uh, he tells us that Krishna, it's Krishna who descends um, into the devotees' minds and senses. Mind and senses. Guru Maharaj has been discussing this a little bit. Um, some of these points are things that you might recognize from the talks yesterday and somewhat today. So he says, Shri Britt Sri Rajendra Nandana, the son of Nanda Maharaj, the king of Braja, the original personality of Godhead, whose existence is implied by the Upanishadic passage, which after confirming that the supreme truth is beyond even Brahman, the support or foundation of the, uh, of the individual soul that has attained supreme bliss, states, he is rasa, and only by attaining him does one truly become ever blissful. Um, this is the uh, statement from um, Shaita, is it Shaita Svatara Upanishad? I'm not sure. No. Um, Raso Vaisa Rasa uh, Rasam Yevaya Labdhavan Dipavati. So Krishna is Rasa, but he's not going to settle for just that Krishna is Rasa. This is one, I mean, we could say, right, God is love in a sense. Um, then he continues, this same Rajendra Nandana Sri Krishna is confirmed to be the embodiment of rasa by the Bhagavad Purana, the essence of Vedanta and the most authoritative scripture of all when it says, to the wrestlers he appeared like the thunderbolt, 
To ordinary men, he appeared like a great hero. To women, he was love personified, etc. This is a verse from when Krishna enters the uh, wrestling arena in Mathura, and everyone has a different experience of Krishna. So Krishna is not just Rasa, but he's um, Rasa Raj. He's the king of Rasa. Not only is he the king of Rasa, he's the king of all Rasas. Um, they are all his. And in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna himself confirms that he is the ultimate basis of Brahma, Brahmanami Pratishtam. This Vrajendra Nandana Sri Krishna possesses a body that has no beginning and which is equipped with names, forms, attributes, and pastimes that are purely spiritual. This Supreme Person descends into our senses, mind, and intellect by his own free will without awaiting any cause, just as he appears in the Yadu dynasty as Sri Krishna and in the Raghu dynasty as Sri Rama in accordance with his own supremely independent will. Um, so, he's, he's just making this case. Krishna is completely independent and Krishna enters the devotee's senses. Just as uh, Swami was explaining um, yesterday, I think, um, Lord Chaitanya um, gives Sanatan Goswami some instructions in Antilila. Sanatan Goswami um, comes to Puri to get the darshan of Lord Chaitanya um, and comes to the Charikanda forest and contracts some kind of disease from the water that he drank and it creates open oozing sores all over his body and it creates no end of distress for Sanatana because he's remembering how affectionately Mahaprabhu deals with him whenever he sees him. I mean, he, he showed up at the house of, um, oh gosh, in, in uh, Varanasi. Whose house did he get? Uh, was Lord Chaitanya staying in? Tapana Mishra. Tapana Mishra, I think. And Lord Chaitanya said, there's a saintly person at the door. You should go see. And he went to the door and there's this kind of bum. Dressed, dressed like a like a Sufi bum, Sufi beggar, hanging out outside. Because Sanatana had escaped, I had, at this point, had just escaped from prison, spent considerable time in trouble going through the um, all the back roads and trails, and he disguised himself as a uh, the Bengali is uh, Dharavesh. Um, Dharavesh is the same word as our English Dervish, which is a kind of Sufi mendicant, apparently. So he didn't look like a saintly person, you know, to a Vaishnava at least. Because I don't see any Vaishnava out there, just some Sufi bum. And uh, Lord Chaitanya says, oh, no, 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 that's Sanatana. He's a great soul and embraced him. So Sanatana's remembering all these affectionate dealings. Every time Mahabharu sees him, he gives him a, a big hug. And he's, now his body is covered with all these oozing sores. And as he gets to Jagannath Puri, he realizes, I can't go to the Jagannath temple because I'm disgusting. I'm contaminated. Everybody will be grossed out. I'll be chased away. Um, and, and I can't go see the Lord because he's just going to, he's going to get all mushy and want to give me a hug and it's just going to be really offensive. And Lord Chaitanya comes to see him and Hari Das and he goes through this whole thing and he ends up telling him, you don't get it. The body of a Vaishnava can never be contaminated. It can never be disgusting. Besides, look, how could you ever be disgusting to me? You and Haridas, I see you as my little boys. And a parent doesn't get upset, you know, if their kid drools on them, or if they get even stool or urine on them, cleaning them, or even, you know, doing whatever. 
mother doesn't get upset. You know, that's part of the job. She knows it. Sometimes, well, at least before they start eating real food while they're still just simply nursing. It's kind of like yogurt. Although they, they say the mother sees it as sandalwood paste. I don't remember that experience in my family so much. But, um, but it's, you know, it's not like you're grossed out because your kid has a dirty diaper or, or uh, watered the floor or something like that. Um, it's cute, you clean it up, and you know, of course after a couple of years you get tired of it, get them potty trained. But he says, that's just, you know, that's, but beyond that, he says, the Vaishnava's body is never contaminated. And then he tells him that at the time of initiation, as the uh, devotee engages in, in self-surrender, Atma Samarpa, he says, Krishna accepts his body as being as good as his own. And in the previous verse, he's described the devotee's body as chidanamoy, constituted of knowledge and bliss. And then he says it again a couple of verses later. The devotee's body is chidanamoy. So the devotee's bodies are not material bodies. They're sakhagadehas. And Lord Chaitanya makes it really clear to Sanatana, here's the deal. You gave yourself to me. That's not your body anymore. It's not yours to do with as you like. It's mine. And I have some things I want to do with that body. So you best take care of it. And then he gave Sanatan a big hug. <laughs> and all the sores were cured. He was cured of his disease and all the sores went away. So this is um, this was um, the point Lord Chaitanya was making. And uh, Maharaj was talking the other day about how um, our senses become spiritualized, and Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains here how that happens. Sri Brajendranandana, the son of Nanda Maharaj, the king of Raja, is the original personality of Godhead whose existence, oops, okay, that's wrong, and so is that. I guess I covered that. So anyway, that's the point. He says that it's Krishna who descends into, into the devotee's body, and then he starts to explain how, he, how, he, how that happens. And he begins by pointing out that as independent as Krishna is, Bhakti is just as independent. She is completely independent. Bhakti, which possesses the same attributes as the Lord in order to prove that she manifests completely independently, acts without depending on any cause, just as he does. That Bhakti manifests in an individual without any reason for doing so is the intent of the Bhagavatam text. Devotional to the service to the Lord is causeless, ahoytuki and unimpeded, apratihata. So we find this right at the very beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam in the second chapter, right? That pure devotional service is ahoytukiya um, pratihata. Because it's not caused by anything external, there isn't anything that can get in its way. Completely independent. And then he goes further with some verses from the 11th canto. He says, similarly, the word yadrachaya, by chance, appears repeatedly in the Bhagavatam. If by chance one attains faith in hearing my glories, if by chance one attains bhakti, 
or attained by chance. In these cases, it means by its or his, or in this case, her own will. Since the dictionary defines yadrucha as independence or freedom of will and action. So just as Krishna is yadrucha, Bhakti Devi is also yadrucha, but it gets better. Bhakti's appearance doesn't depend on any external cause. And then he cites, uh, we could, we could uh, find some evidence in the Gopal Tapani Upanishad, which says, Sri Krishna, the personification of concentrated knowledge and bliss is present within the practices of bhakti, which are pure being, consciousness, and joy. Um, and then Jiva Goswami um, supports this idea in his Preeti Sandarbha. Preeti Sandarbha, I think, is the last of the Sandarbhas, which explores the Prayojana, which is Preeti, or Krishna Prema. And he cites something called the Mathura Shruti. Shruti. I asked about it before and I've forgotten if I found out anything about just what the Mathura Shruti is. But he says, um, Bhakti Revayana Nayati, Bhakti Revayana Darshayati, Bhakti Vashapurusha, Bhakti Reva Gu, you see. Bhakti brings one near to the Lord. Bhakti makes one see the Lord. Bhakti puts the Lord under her control. We'll see more of that tomorrow. Bhakti puts the Lord under her control. Bhakti is the greatest thing of all. Greater than Krishna? I'll tune in tomorrow uh, and we'll see just how great uh, bhakti can be. So, although there are certain things that are helpful, it's, it becomes quite clear that bhakti doesn't depend, oh my gosh, on anything at all um, um, to make an appearance. My work, somehow or other, I lost my, um, most of my notes. Could you run up and um, grab my book? Yeah, I think it's on, well, I can't remember. It's, it's out somewhere, maybe on the bed. I had many more pages of notes and somehow or other something happened when I moved it to my iPad apparently and I didn't check. So Bhakti is a very, uh, a very powerful force, powerful enough um, to make us um, see the Lord and um, to bring us into the Lord's presence and even um, to bring the Lord to heal. Um, the followers of the um, Brajabhasis know that. Radharani um, is always bringing Krishna to heal. Um, and when uh, we, we know how when Jayadeva Goswami was writing um, I was writing Gita Govinda and he came to a passage where he saw Krishna taking the dust from Radharani's lotus feet. He just thought, wait, that, man, well, that, that doesn't make any sense at all. And uh, decided to go out for a walk to clear his head. And there was a whole drama and he came back. Krishna, in the meantime, Krishna had come, eaten Jayadev's lunch, disguised as Jayadev. And, uh, and written in the phrase. And so Jayadev got back and he saw his wife taking lunch and he said, Ma, why are you taking lunch without me? And she said, you already had lunch. You came back from your walk, I fed you, and you went back into your room and went to work. Got back to writing. And he said, what? So he went into his room and he looked at the manuscript and there it was. 
He had scratched it out and it was written back in. And he realized, oh, Krishna has, uh, has, let me, has made it very clear to me that this is the case. That he finds himself subordinate to Radharani. And uh, he saw himself after that as servant of Padmavati. Maharaj likes to make the point that in a family or in a relationship or in any group, whoever is most Krishna conscious is the leader. It doesn't matter on, you, on a position. So it doesn't matter whether you're the oldest person or the person with some kind of rank or whether you're the, the daddy or whatever. Uh, the person who's most Krishna conscious is the and we have stories about that too. Um, but I need to move on. It's going to be a little messier because I had everything all picked out. So then we might ask, what does it mean when we say that if, you know, if, we, were to, if we were to concede that bhakti appears of her own will, what, what does that mean? So Vishwanath continues. If one takes the word yaduchaya to mean by some great good fortune, then one must ask where this good fortune, whence this good fortune arises. Does it come from pious activities or is it in, uh, independent of such works? If we accept that pious activities are the cause of good fortune, then that means that bhakti is subject to, subject to one, one's good deeds, which contradicts what has been established. That is, that bhakti is self-manifesting. On the other hand, if this good fortune is not the result of pious activities, then the cause being inexplicable remains unknown. The cause, if the cause of the good fortune itself cannot be entertained, how can we accept that it causes bhakti? Vishwanath Shokavarti Thakur does not take anything for granted. He, if he, when he wants to make a case, he makes it very thoroughly. If you were uh, in court, you'd want someone like Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur as your advocate, because there will be no stone left unturned. And there will be people in the courtyard who are probably um, looking for an opportunity to grab a quick nap or check their email on their phone or something. Um, he says, how can one thing that cannot be, cannot be ascertained be identified as the cause of something else. If, on the other hand, one argues that the Lord's mercy is the cause of bhakti, we're still obliged to ask about the causes of his mercy. Inquiring ever further from one cause to the next, one is unable to come to any conclusion. So he admits this can become an endless chain of inquiry. If we argue that the cause of bhakti must be the Lord's unconditioned or causeless mercy, then we have to ask, why don't we see this mercy everywhere? Why do some get that mercy and others not? So that implies that the Lord shows favoritism. However, when the Lord destroys demons in order to protect his devotees, his favoritism is considered uh, is not considered to be a fault, but an ornament to glory. This is because the Lord's affection for his devotees is a supreme quality, ruling over all his other attributes like a king over his subjects. And that'll, that's something that's explored later. And so, how does this happen? Well, he continues. If the unconditioned mercy of the devotee is taken to be the cause of the bhakti, of bhakti, 
Okay, so if if the Lord's if it's the Lord's unconditioned mercy, and we can't understand that, then okay, let's say it's got to be the Lord's devotees. So Vishwanath Chakravarti won't leave that alone either. He says, if the unconditioned mercy of the devotee is taken to be the cause of bhakti, one may ask whether it is proper for the devotees to be partial. Right? Shouldn't they be merciful to everyone? The Bhagavatam, however, accepts partiality as the natural characteristic of the Madhyama Bhaktas, who show love for the Lord, friendship um, for the devotees, mercy to the ignorant, and indifference to those who hate the Lord. So the Madhima Bhaktas, they're fit to teach, they're fit to spread the Lord's mercy because they can make some distinctions. That's just their nature. This is why the Lord's partiality is understandable, for He is always under the control of His devotees, and so His mercy follows theirs. In fact, it is the bhakti residing in the devotee's heart that is the main cause of His bestowing mercy on others, since there's no possibility of His mercy manifesting without bhakti. We must conclude once again that devotion is indeed completely self-manifesting. So here's how it works. Bhakti Devi takes shelter in the heart of the devotees. And when one of those devotees, moved by bhakti, because what other reason, whatever, whatever, what other cause could there be? When one of those devotees moved by mercy shows some mercy to someone, Bhakti Devi follows his lead. The Lord follows his lead through his um, mercy giving, mercy potency. It's not, it, I mean, there are a lot of arguments and Vishwanath Chakravarti, I mean, you can, but I mean, there's a lot of complicated stuff, you know, in here. He talks about the Bhagavatam as being the ultimate pramana, and you, have, you can go through all the um, different kinds of pramana, different kinds of evidence that Jiva Goswami discusses in Tattva Siddharma. Could do that, but we don't have to because we're family, because we're followers of the Bhagavatam and the Bhagavats. So, we accept that. Uh, if we were going outside to, to try to explain this um, to people who weren't at all acquainted with Bhakti, I'm not sure why we would, uh, then we might have to make those arguments very systematically, present all those things. But the point he makes here is, that um, because it is the nature of the Madhima Bhaktas to show mercy to those who are innocent, to those who are ignorant, and just to ignore those who have antipathy for the Lord, to associate in a friendly way with the devotees and to worship the Lord with love, because that's just their nature and bhakti resides in their heart, they will be kind to people. It just happens. And when they're kind, when, when such a devotee is kind to someone, something happens. You know, if you share, if, if you share a little bhakti with someone, well, then they become, we could say they become infected. We'll, find, we'll discover a different word tomorrow. Um, or we could, you know, it's just as if I had um, the flu. You know, if I had, this, this, a re and say there's a really nasty flu going around in the winter, and Swami Ashram is down with the flu. 
Nobody's going to want to come hang out with him then. That room up there, that would be a lonely place, except for those kind souls that are going to come up every once in a while with a mask on and gloves and a hazmat suit and, um, and see if I need some water. Um, see if I, am I strong enough to go to the bathroom by myself or do I need help to the door or whatever. Um, because if you get too near that person, you get infected. Maharaj was also talking about how bhakti comes in to the heart and grows in the heart and then eventually overflows. And uh, Anadi, Anadi is not here. Anadi Krishna, as I was making the halva today, and I pour the boiling syrup into the very hot grain that's you know, being toasted in the, in the butter and there's this big explosion and because I never got to do this in, when I was in the military uh, my weapon was a desk and maps and charts um, I yelled fire in the hole because there's going to be a big explosion and hot syrupy semolina goes all over the place and Anadi Krishna says, oh yes, because you're from Hawaii, you're making volcanoes. <laughs> I actually used to live on, on a volcano in Hawaii. Our house was uh, on the slopes of Kilauea, which is a very, which is a very active volcano right now. Um, so if you get near too near the vol volcano, just like the golden volcano of love, Sri Darshila Sridhar Maharaj's uh, image of Lord Chaitanya, you're going to get something on you, you know. It's going to... If, the, if you get... If, some, if a vessel, like a devotee's heart, becomes too full of bhakti, some spills over, and anyone who's too close gets some on them. It's natural. It's not complicated. Not really. And so, what does this mean? Um, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, in the text in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, if one attains faith in the service of the Lord by some great fortune, um, the words some great fortune specifically refer to the mercy of a devotee. A fortune that surpasses anything from good works. One may argue that since a devotee is also under the control of the Lord, here we go again, right? He's not going to let anything go easily. Right? He takes nothing for granted. One may argue that since a devotee is also under the control of the Lord, it's impossible for the mercy to be primary. But this is incorrect. For the Lord himself has given primacy to his devotees by submitting himself to their control and by turning his power to bestow mercy over to them. He has made them agents of Krishna's mercy, of his mercy-giving power. Radharani Bhakti Devi is Krishna's Kripa Shakti and the devotees who are in that middle stage, or who can behave in that middle stage, even if they're more advanced, um, they become agents of Krishna's Kripa Shakti, agents of Radharani. They got their badges. Heart police, ma'am. Open up, and by that, I mean, Open up your heart, right? <laughs> Although the Lord, as the indwelling super soul, limits himself to overseeing the jiva's external sense activities, in accordance with the destiny given them at birth, he is still observed to bestow mercy on his devotees. As the Lord says in the Gita, by my grace, devotees attain the supreme peace which exists fully within me. However, the grace Prasad, spoken of here, refers to the power of mercy, Kripa Shakti, that he bestows on his devotees, as explained above. Um, and 
then he has a really long passage. Oh, we can kind of skip this. He, he asks about pious works being a factor in bhakti. So, if Bhakti Devi is Yadracha, completely independent, and we receive Bhakti through great good fortune. Well, what does that what is great good fortune? Well, in Sanskrit it's Atipagya. Sometimes I've overcharacterized Atipagya as just well, frankly, it is. It's fortune, it's fortune so great that we really can't estimate it. Sometimes Srila Prabhupada talked about uh, the chances of coming in contact with bhakti, chances of getting bhakti um, um, to a turtle swimming in the ocean. And I used to live in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I know the ocean, I can tell you. If you haven't seen the ocean, I can t I can I'll, I'll tell you the ocean is very big. It's very big and it's very deep. That's why the ocean is used as the figure of speech for things that are inestim inestimably enormous. The Pacific Ocean is huge. So you have a turtle, a, a sea turtle, swimming through in Hawaii. We call them honu. That's the Hawaiian word for turtle. So Honu is swimming through the, through the ocean. She's swimming in you know, maybe 50, 60 feet under the ocean. And she comes up to the surface for a breath of air. And as she breaks the surface, there's a board floating in the ocean. And there's a big knot hole somewhere in that board. And her head comes up right through that knot hole. That's, those are the, ch that's the chances. If, we're, if you talk about um, this great good fortune as luck, that's the kind of luck it would take. Chaitanya Charitamrita tells us, Brahmanda Pramite Koma Bhagyavana Guru Krishna Prasade Pai Bhakti Lata Beach. That after wandering throughout the Brahmanda, that doesn't just mean from body to body, it means from universe to universe for goodness knows how long. Those souls who are very fortunate by the mercy of Krishna and the Guru, they get that seed of devotion, bija uh, of the bhakti lata. So it's a it's a it's a rare thing. It's a, it's quite a rare thing, and so we are very fortunate. And I think one of the points I might have made last year is. What do we do when we're very fortunate? Well, if that fortune is bhakti, she's going to make us want to share it, at least with each other, right? So, um, if not, you know, if not others, as bhakti grows in our hearts, that tendency to be kind to everyone we encounter, to show a little mercy. Um, will grow as well. And the whole, this whole progression of bhakti begins before bhakti um, in, uh, in the second chapter of the Bhagavatam um, where um, the uh, different stages of bhakti that Rupa Goswami has uh, described in uh, Bhakti Rasamri to Sindhu, nine stages of bhakti that are explored in Madhurya Kadambani um, are implied Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur points out, you could also say there's, there are 14 stages of bhakti, which, and they begin before shraddha. Some contact with a devotee and some good, some like jnata sukriti. Just uh, an example that uh, uh, Tripurari Maharaj likes to give is a, a doorman um, in New York. Sri Prabhupada was in New York, he was in, for some meeting or something. And so they pulled up, they pulled the car up in front of some fancy building, hotel or something, one of those buildings that has a doorman. And this doorman, it's just his job. It's just his job, you know, it's just what he does all day, for eight hours a day, every day. Car pulls up, he goes and he opens the door and he lets the passengers out. 
and then he walks with them to the door of the hotel and opens the door for them. It's just his job. But this day, he did it for Srila Prabhupada. And Srila Prabhupada was appreciative. The guy didn't know he was doing great service, that he was facilitating some kind of important meeting for spreading Lord Chaitanya's teachings all over the world. He was just doing his job. So it wasn't necessarily some great bhakti, and he didn't say, oh my God, it's his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. <coughs> Did full dandavats on the sidewalk before he went to open the door, and, and then offered obeisances again as Prabhupada walked through the door, and the door, you know, it wasn't anything like that. The guy was just doing his job. But he got some sukriti, some bhakti sukriti, which means sometime in the future he'll get another opportunity to do something for a devotee. And gradually he'll appreciate what he's doing. He'll understand what he's doing. He'll think, oh, this is cool. I get to do something um, for, um, for the devotees. This is, this is going to make, this make today a really good day. So, anyway, so he dismisses uh, karma, jnana, and yoga as, as possibilities for having anything to do with bhakti. Um, they just, he, he makes a, a progressively strong case for um, for uh, the independence of bhakti. And then when he gets to the end, he, he cites another, he refers to another verse from the 11th, cap, 11th canto. Bhaktya sanjataya bhaktya. He says the text, bhaktya sanjataya bhaktya. Bhakti is the cause of bhakti. Bhakti comes from bhakti. Um, teaches us that the fruit of bhakti in practice is bhakti and love for Krishna, showing that bhakti itself is the crest jewel of all human goals. We've thus described to some extent how bhakti, this great manifestation of Krishna's essential potency, is all pervading, all enchanting, all enlivening, super excellent, most independent, and self manifesting, just like the Lord. If one takes to any other path than bhakti, then what can be said? other than that he or she is lacking in vision. They can't even be cons uh, fully considered a human being, for the Shastras say, who but a less than human would refuse to serve the Lord? So he's ma he makes a really, throughout these um, introductory sections to Madhurya Kadamani, he makes a very strong, very compelling argument that Nothing other than bhakti causes bhakti. So what causes bhakti in our hearts? The bhakti in the hearts of the devotees we come in contact with. And as um, maybe it was Monday, Maharaj pointed out that although bhakti isn't inherent in the soul, because the soul is constituted of Swarup Shakti and Bhakti Devi is constituted, I mean, the, the, the soul is constituted of Tatastha Shakti and Bhakti is constituted of Krishna's Swarup Shakti. They're different things. The Swarup Shakti is not going to be inherently a part of the Tatastha Shakti. They're, they're completely different Shaktis. But because bhakti is so powerful, she can influence, she can enter that tatastha shakti and change its nature. She, but by um, uh, entering the devotee's mind and senses, she purifies them of all impurities. So, we get bhakti from the bhaktas who, have, who carry bhakti in their heart. And we practice bhakti in the stage of sadhana. And the result of the sadhya of practicing sadhana bhakti is, is bhava bhakti. 
and as we engage in bhava bhakti, then that becomes kind of a sadhana in the sense that it also has something to yield, and that's prema bhakti. So, prema bhakti comes from sadhana bhakti. There's a, there is a, a close connection. Bhaktiya sanjataya bhaktiya. We'll see this tomorrow. Bhaktiya sanjataya bhaktiya. One meaning is prema bhakti comes from sadhana bhakti. It's sadhana bhakti that causes prema bhakti. Because sadhana bhakti gives us bhava bhakti, which gives us prema bhakti. You don't get prema bhakti without sadhana bhakti. Unless you're a very rare Kripa Siddha. But Srila Prabhupada said, you don't bank on getting an honorary degree. You, you don't sit around at home and play video games thinking, oh, I'm going to get an honorary PhD and then I can go be a big shot. No, you get your honorary PhD for doing something after having, you know, whether you have any I mean, you can have scabs of degrees or no degrees at all. And you get an honorary degree because you've done something. So, um, Srila Prabhupada says that we should, we should always expect Krishna's mercy, but we should behave as if everything depended on our practice. Um, don't leave any bases uncovered. Oh, that's an American metaphor. Baseball. Um, so that's, um, that's where I wanted to go today. I just wanted to kind of lay that out. I wanted just to lay that foundation um, that Bhakti Devi is every bit as independent as Krishna and she is the most powerful force. Um, there is uh, no force more powerful than bhakti. And we'll see, we'll see that a little more, we'll see considerably more of that um, tomorrow. I don't remember whether, I think I'm scheduled in the evening tomorrow because I was scheduled in the morning today. So we'll see more of that tomorrow evening. Does anyone have any questions or anything? They'd like to add or any discussion, any kind of any discussion. Krishna Karma Prabhu. I have a question about this word Yadritraya, which means somehow or other or by chance. Because Shabbat said that, that there is no such thing as a chance. Of course he said this in the context of scientists claim that uh, life comes uh, came from matter by chance. But my question is, if Krishna has something to, to say about who, who you meet the body and who you're not. Because if someone is we meet the body, there is a chance that he will be infected, as we said, yeah? So good chance, yeah. So I sometimes I thought about why someone is at all meet the body and it's not. No, well, uh, uh, ja mam takie pytanie odnośnie tego słowa Jadricza, co oznacza w taki czy inny sposób albo przez, yy, przez przypadek, dlatego że się próba z jednej strony powiedział, że nie ma czegoś takiego jak przypadek. Oczywiście on to powiedział w kontekście takiego poznajmienia naukowców, że życie yy, powstało z materii przez przypadek. Yy, no i um, yeah. Well, the first thing is, um, Vishwanath explains that yadrucha doesn't mean exactly by chance. It means as if by chance. I used to sometimes joke that um, it happens by. Well, I don't know if there's. Um, an equivalent Polish idiom for this, but in English we have uh, something we call dumb luck. You just stumble into it. But it's not that that is exactly the case. 
There is a background. There's a background. There's usually a background of some Agyata Sukriti that people are moved to come into, into the uh, association um, of devotees. For example, Guru Maharaj was explaining this morning um, his first contact with the, the Maha Mantra was on the back of an incense package. Mine was um, by hearing the Maha Mantra as a song from the 1960s tribal rock musical Hair. And there was a, um, a song on that, in, in that musical. Um, and it was, it was these people from the 60s, draft dodgers and hippies and folks, encountering the Hare Krishna devotees. And so there was chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Kind of went down like that. It was like Prabhupada's tomb, but it went down at the end of, uh, you know, uh, of the, uh, the line. So um, that I first heard it on uh, KPOY FM radio. This was the late 1960s. We had an underground, non-commercial FM radio station in Honolulu. And the format of the radio station was whatever the disc jockey on duty wanted to do during his or her shift. The only requirement, there were no commercials. The radio station was funded entirely by uh, promoting uh, uh, concerts rock concerts in Honolulu. And um, so there were no commercials and there was no one that anyone was um, beholden to, no one that anyone had to answer to. The only requirement was one required by a federal agency that at the top of the hour and the bottom of the hour, they had to announce the time the station and the location. It's, tw this is, it's 12 o'clock. This is KBOI FM radio on Lulu, Hawaii. That was the only requirement. Sometimes they would play 24 hours of Beatles. <laughs> it's a very interesting station. Now, there was one other requirement that, that um, uh, was happening back then that I also found uh, came across around, just about the same time I maybe, no, maybe it was after I actually met the devotees. But, and that was that they had to have two hours of uh, religious programming every week. So KPOI FM, KPOI FM had two hours, seven o'clock Sunday morning, the Hare Krishna show. And after I met the devotees, somehow or other I found out about that show and I started listening. And then the second hour was, uh, they called it a gospel hour. It was an interesting mixture of gospel music and uh, 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 black power politics. This was the 1960s. The people who did that, because later when I moved into the temple, I used to do that show regularly. The, uh, Soon, the Hare Krishna show on, on Monday morning, uh, Sunday mornings. And so I got to know these people who, were, who did the Gospel Hour. We became friends. They were really nice people. Um, and, and although it's a little shameful, um, because I was a brahmachari at the time, I actually developed a bit of a crush on one of the young women who did the Gospel Hour show. Um, but, um, and Krishna protected me because I was just in, you know, when they started their show, it was time for us to leave. But um, sometimes they would play the soundtrack for this tribal rock musical hair, and I'd hear the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Now, I thought the other songs were, some of them were cute, some of them were naughty. Ha ha, that isn't that fun. Um, but that was the one that I, that stuck with me. And that was the one that I listened to. And then one day in 1969, after having become, become accustomed to chanting Hare Krishna by hearing it on the radio, 
as part of the Hair soundtrack, I went to a Jimi Hendrix concert, it's a whole story, and there were the devotees. And that was kind of the end of my life right there. Uh, it was the most, well, Mr. Hendrix had some problems with the, with the equipment, so his part of the concert didn't go on very long. So actually the most impressive part of the evening was definitely the devotees, who ended up with several thousand people chanting Hare Krishna and dancing in Kapiolani Park on a full moon night in the spring of 1969. And that was, that was when I first came in contact with the devotees. Um, and I never looked back, I guess. Although there were times that I might have tried. So, this is a power, really powerful experience. It seems as if it happens by chance. I mean, how does a guy like me, a kid from Lompo, California, who grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, dropped out of college, ended up in the Navy in Hawaii, a surf bar, end up dancing up and down the streets of Honolulu, trying to turn other people onto Krishna consciousness, and then continuing for the next so far 40, going on 48 years. Where did that come from? But Srila Prabhupada saw how easily it happened with us. But there, I heard it on the radio. I saw it on an incense pack. I met Jayananda, <laughs> right? Well, that's all you have. That's all that has to happen. You meet Jayananda. Um, it doesn't matter if there's any Sukriti in the background. If you happen to just bump into Jayananda in line at the store, your fortune is made for the rest you know, for the rest of eternity. Um, so it, it appears to happen as if by chance, but it's really all part of a plan. And as, as Maharaj was pointing out, bhakti isn't originally inherent in the jiva because it's a different shakti. But once bhakti enters the jiva, she is inherent in the jiva. We're infected. Just like in a zombie movie. <laughs> Got the Walking Dead or something. Um, so it appears to happen by chance, and but there is a background for each and every one of us that somewhere along the way we've gotten some good fortune, we've received some good fortune. And we see, I mean, someone from an upper middle class American family like most, many, so many of us, I'm sure the Prabhupada's disciples, um, to give that all up and go sleep on the floor somewhere, taking bath outside with a garden hose, as we did in Honolulu, or these devotees living in New Vrindavan, taking bath in a pond covered with ice. They have to break the ice because the, it froze over after the devotee, just uh, or previous devotee just took a bath. It's already frozen over. It's so cold out. How do you explain that? There's got to be something in the background that moves them to live like that. And, you know, we could say, you could say there are things that we gave up, but what we got was so much more. What did we give up? We used to go door to door preaching in Honolulu in, the, in those early, in the early 70s. We went we must have gone to probably about 70% of the homeless on Oahu. And we would go out in the afternoons after lunch prasada. And we would go door to door. And, oh, maybe that's a sign. Am I off the hook now? <laughs> um, we would go door to door, knock on people's doors, and we would try to see if they would take it back to Godhead or take one of the books. or. In, Sometimes people would invite us into their homes. And sometimes we'd have lengthy, interesting discussions about religion and <coughs> philosophy. But we would see how their homes were crammed 
full of stuff. And sometimes we would walk out of those beautiful homes, big, beautiful homes. Some of the neighborhoods we went to were very poor. Some of the neighborhoods we went to were very wealthy. Kahala, Diamond Head Drive, some of these places are multi-million dollar mansions. And um, we, I don't think any of us found ourselves attracted to that. Rather, we were generally kind of turned off. But we could get in there and we think, well, God, how do they take care of all this stuff? They have shelves and the shelves are all full, full, filled with stuff. I mean, it's just stuff. Tea sets or you know, whatever. It's just stuff you have to dust all the time. And then, oh my God, if you move, forget it. It's crazy. I, we never had all that much stuff. And moving was hell every time we moved. It was as if my wife and I, you know, by the end of the day, it was almost like my wife and I were ready to get a divorce. Because <laughs> it was just such a grind all day long. Hauling sofas and things up stairs, and boxes and boxes, and our kids, they were little girls, they couldn't do that much. You know, they helped, but they couldn't do that much. By the end of the day, we were both so tired and angry and angry, or angry at the world, angry at each other, we didn't want to see each other. It was awful. Awful. Um, so we were, you know, we, we were horrified by that stuff. We didn't think it was something to aspire for. And we went back to our, well, at first it was, we had a room, there were eight, about eight of us in the, in, in the whole state. And then later in 1970, there were probably about 40 of us living in the temple. And then later in 1970, Siddha Ananda joined and some of his devotees stayed in Honolulu, while others went to India, others to San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, and London. Um, so we were pretty full, and we didn't even have places to sleep. I slept outside because I took care of the Tulsi trees. I slept generally. I would sleep outside under the Tulsi trees. They were big enough even then to sleep under. Um, of course, it would often rain at night back in the valley where we had our temple then, so I would be awakened by the rain, and I'd have to go find some place sheltered to sleep. Um, and we were happy as clams. You know, if someone had come to try to talk any of us out of leaving, it would have been, it would have been a failure. You know, we had to leave because of our own, you know, our own, and old desires aroused by offenses or inattentive chanting or something like that. So it seems as if it happens by chance, but it's. It's, here we are, we're making progress, life after life. What we don't complete in this life, we pick up in the next. Some of you have seen that in your kids. I remember my kids, you know, as toddlers, saying just extraordinary things that came, seemed to come out of nowhere. And my wife and I would look at each other like, Mom, did you hear that? Where did that come from? They were really cool. One, my younger daughter, once my older daughter, okay, said, Peter, Peter. And my younger daughter, who was maybe two, she said, it's not Peter, it's Peter. <laughs> I went, what? Where in the world did that come from? Um, so there's a background. And it's all part of a big plan, um, and we'll see. It, we'll, see, we'll see some other aspects of that tomorrow night. It's as if by chance, Otipadi, great good fortune. We're so lucky. We don't. We almost don't know how lucky are we are. We have some sense, I think. That's why we devotees all go to the trouble to come together here for a week every year. And it's, it, is, it is trouble. It's trouble even for the devotees who aren't helping to organize it. So much trouble for them. I can imagine 
praying, beating his brains out, trying to find tickets for Swami and me that are in the budget that he has. And uh, they're not always fun rides, but we get here. We get here, we have a wonderful few days in all the devotees' company. Um, and then we have to go back, but we know we can come back next year again. So, um, we, are, we're, we're, we are very fortunate. We, I think we all have um, some sense of that. And uh, that's what, I think that's a lot of what we talk about while we're together, too. We're, we're family. Is that okay? Nice dodge. <laughs> Did I dodge it nicely? Anything else? I've got a question about. Oh, Kalpatur? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was reading uh, in Bhagavad on this topic uh, with commentaries by Shantachakar Thakur. Uh, about the independence of Bhakti. In one point, uh, Vishnu Chakravarta Thakur says that Krishna, he cannot show his mercy wherever he wants because he's the God of justice. Therefore, Bhakti, the, the Bhakti can do it. Which seems to me like Bhakti is more independent than Krishna. Even. <laughs> In a sense. Yeah, just translate it. Uh, in uh, uh, Bhagavatam, Vishnu Chakravarta Thakur mówi, że Krishna is Bogiem Sprawiedliwości, więc nie można go pokazywać jakkolwiek chce w swojej łaski, ale Bhakti może. I tak się też wyraża, co to znaczy. We see that with Nityananda Prabhu as well. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was living as a sannyasi, so he had to be very careful about his behavior and his association. He generally, um, when there, well, he generally ate in the homes of brahmanas, but we also see that he would often eat in the homes of devotees, whether they were brahmanas or not. Um, he couldn't mix freely with everyone and anyone. He couldn't go anywhere and everywhere as a sannyasi. Um, it, it, it would be scandalous if I were to walk into um, a liquor store or one of those cigarette stands at the, next to the gas stations um, uh, or into a, a bar or saloon, something like that, um, or a place where ladies of the night work. It would be, um, it would be a scandal. And, um, You'd hear about it on the internet five minutes before it happened. It'd be all over Facebook before I even thought about doing it. Um, so, as a sannyasi, Mahaprabhu had to behave in a particular way. So, but he told Nityananda Prabhu, go back to Bengal, get married. That way you can mix with everybody. You can be yourself, you can be you. Um, and in this way, deliver the whole of Bengal. So Nityananda Prabhu went back to uh, Bengal, and he, so he had some, in a sense, he had some independence that Lord Chaitanya didn't have, because he was married to uh, Janava and Vasudha, and, uh, and mixing with the ordinary people of Bengal. Nityananda Prabhu didn't. Nityananda Prabhu didn't discriminate at all. He was giving out free samples. Bhaktivinoda Thakur's song, Dalalaya Gita, the song of the merchant, he says, Lord Nityananda Prabhu has opened a marketplace for the holy name. And he's got a pretty steep price, a little bit of faith. If you can come up with a little bit of faith, Nityananda Prabhu will give you the holy name of Krishna, the greatest treasure, imported directly from Goloka Vrindavan. Goloka Vrindavan, Harinam Sankirtan. Um,
you know, and we know Krishna demanded surrender. Lord Chaitanya just asked that we chant the holy name, and Lord Nityananda said, well, I, you, know, you can't chant the holy name of Krishna, chant the name of Gora. I don't care how fallen you are, the holy name of Gora will deliver you. Um, so, it may seem that bhakti has, you know, if you look at it, if you look at Krishna as the god of justice, that bhakti has um, perhaps more independence than he. Um, and that may be why he deputes the devotees to act as his agents in representing Bhakti Devi, his Kripa Shakti agents of Krishna's Kripa Shakti, secret agents. Dun, 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 dun. Badge 108. Is that okay? That's the best I can do for now. Is there anything else? Time to say to? So I was thinking now about Bhakti and the Nuran we give to Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda. So generally, as I remember, Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda appear very rarely. So how does it look in other kalpas? Because mercy doesn't exist there. Well, we, we see in Chaitanya Charitamrita that this Lord Chaitanya is considered the most merciful avatar because he gives what, practically speaking, has never been given before. At least hasn't been given in a long time. Act real love of God. Not just love of God, um, but the kind of love that um, the residents of uh, Raja Bhumi feel for Krishna. And even more rarely, um, the uh, kind of love that the Rajabhadhus, the uh, damsels, the young ladies of, of Brajabhumi feel for Krishna. It's very rare. So, now we can, um, we have to recalculate our good fortune. Because this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity that comes according to the Shastras, once in a lifetime of Brahma, once in a year, once a day, once in a day of Brahma, once in a really long time, once in a day of Brahma, I guess. It's still pretty rare. It's not every Kali Yuga. There's a Yuga avatar, Mahavishnu, um, comes as the Yuga avatar in most Kali Yugas. In this Kali Yuga, Mahavishnu called Lord Chaitanya in place of the Yuga Avatar. Pumkar. I love the sixth chapter of Adi Lila because you can keep coming across this Advaita Acharya Prabhu, Pumkar, bellowing, roaring for Lord Chaitanya to come. Situation is really dire, it says. You have to come yourself this time. This is it. This is the time. You come yourself. This is your chance, and this is their chance. This is your chance to uh, try to experience Radha's love, and this is their chance um, to get a taste of the uh, Chadipa, the four. Uh, 
Lord Ch uh, has Krishna, uh, Krishna Das Kavi Raj Goswami has, has Krishna saying, uh, I shall come myself and taste uh, the love of Godhead, and I shall make everyone dance in the four rasas of Raja. In some kirtan. So, um, it's a very, very rare thing indeed. And um, others are not as fortunate as we are, at least not yet. But they may get an opportunity. There's room in Goloka for them. Because it's not a room like this. Is that okay? Thank you. Jim Queen. Yes. Słyszałem takie stwierdzenie, że pokora buduje relacje między nami a Kryszną. Chodzi mi o to, czym jest ta pokora? Jak Pawła rozumiesz, czym jest ta pokora? Czy to jest. Słyszymy, że należy być tolerancyjny na bardziej niż słowa na ulicy, ale, ale jeżeli inni to widzą, to po prostu nas zjedzą. Czy jest, czy jest jakaś definicja pokory? Czy ona jest? Bo ja rozumiem, że pokora to nie jest całe życie z nosem przy ziemi, że to jest coś innego. To jest I'm not sure if I'm asking properly, but I think it's a question of the, uh, what's the real humbleness, humility. That uh, we hear that humility, tolerance helps us to be in relationship with Krishna. But when we are like this, sometimes people can like step on us. So does humility, humbleness means that we have to like just bow down and let people to walk all over us? It depends. Apparently, I'm getting walked. Not that independent, Asia. I know the drill. I've been called out of the temple or whatever a few times myself. Um, so are you asking if we're too humble that others may take advantage of us and hurt us? Chciałbym wczoraj w Danii usłyszeć, czym jest pokora. Czy you would like to just hear in few sentences what humbleness, real humbleness is, with humility? Like a definition of humility. I'm not sure. Just, just humility. Just humility. I would like to know what humility, humility is because it, we are taught that. Oh, we're, we're told we should be humble. We have to be meek and humble, but in real life people can walk over us and he, he says, well, I sent this something more than just, uh, you know, display of humility. And is there something more to humility? And what's the definition in brief of humility? Oh, in brief. <laughs> <laughs> um, Humility means a willingness to subordinate ourselves to others, to offer respect to others, often even when they're not when such respect is not warranted. It means just dealing respectfully with others. It doesn't necessarily mean being meek. Um, 
because we can be also be very bold in standing up for a devotee and standing up for the truth. Um, so it doesn't mean being meek, it doesn't mean having low self-esteem, and uh, but it does mean understanding how great the Supreme Lord is and how small we are by comparison. Um, we, we, are, we are very small, we are atomic. And our, pow our power is limited, our knowledge is limited, even our um, bliss is limited. We do exist eternally. Um, but um, there was an old Sunday school song about, uh, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. He is great and we are small. Something like that, a very long time ago. Um, that uh, I sang, very long time ago that I sang that song. Um, so humility really means to understand our own position as being small, understanding the limits um, of our knowledge, the limits of our competence. Um, I used to um, be an English professor at colleges and universities in the U.S. And one of the things that I taught was critical thinking. And one component of that that I found very important for students to try to understand was the limits of their knowledge, the limits of the knowledge of their sources when they were trying to support an idea in the papers that they wrote. And so intellectual humility was a, a virtue that I really tried to share with them. Um, it was a little easy for me to be somewhat humble because I was not a big shot professor. I was a little guy, part-time professor who had to teach some two or three campuses just to make a living sometimes. Um, but um, but I have seen I have seen people who uh, uh, demonstrate considerable arrogance. Politicians, cause, uh, college professors, uh, sports fans, professional athletes. Um, so the kind of arrogance you see in some of those people, some of whom I'd rather not name. Um, is the opposite of humility. So sometimes humility means just a, willing, a willingness to listen openly to the other person and try to understand what they have to say. And rather than cut them off and try to defeat them before they can even make a point to show how you know, smart you are or how great your ideas are. Um, sometimes humility means doing what we're asked um, without uh, without much resi without any resistance, because someone's in a position of authority. Um, say, you know, in a spiritual setting, if someone asks us to do something, Madhu Pandit asked me to cook halal. <laughs> Fortunately, I like cooking halava, and I like seeing the devotees eat halava, because good halava makes people smile. It's buttery, it's sweet, and sometimes you put other things in it that make it interesting, get interesting texture. Today it was raisins and walnuts, there's a cardamom underneath there. Oh, oh. Camper taste there, that's nice. Um, but because Madhu Pandit asked, I did it. Namarasana asked me to bring my Takwarjis. Last year I had to travel with just a carry-on because of the nature of the connecting flights. 
I had to run from one airport to another. I didn't have enough time to make it, and I honestly barely made it by two minutes. So I could only come with a carry-on. I could not bring my deities with me. Nam Rasana asked me, please, Maharaj, make sure you bring your deities because we want to bathe Krishna and Balaram, ba Krishna and Balaram in the uh, Abhishek. It was a little trouble to do so. It meant an extra bag. But it was happy trouble. I was happy to bring them here. And I was happy to see how much fun they were having being buried by honey and yogurt. The devotees chuckling. Kalpaturu writing in this world. What am I doing here? <laughs> Just a pile of yogurt. Oh, look the little black spots. Um, So sometimes it just means doing what we're asked um, because someone we respect asked, asked us to do so. Um, sometimes, as in the military, it means carrying out at least legal orders without question. Sometimes humility means standing up boldly and defending the truth. Just as we see our Swami does regularly when people trot out some philosophical misunderstanding, he doesn't sit in the back, back in the shadows and just say, oh, well, they'll figure it out eventually. He just says, no, no, you don't understand. This is what Srila Jiva Goswami says in uh, Krishna Sandarva. And this is what Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says in his commentary on a verse in the ninth canto of Srila Bhagavatam. This is what Srila Rupa Goswami says in uh, Ujjwala Nilamani and Bhakti Rasamani to Sindhu. And he'll just lay it out for them. And if they don't get it, he will go after them. He will keep going and, until he sees, you know, if someone's just not willing to open their mind or their heart, then he'll just walk away. But he's not um, afraid to stand up for the truth. He's not meek. I remember in some discussions on, online a few years ago, one god brother of mine called me meek because I was polite. And I just thought, this guy does not want to take me off because I am not a fun adversary. I'm, I can be a fierce adversary. So he needs to watch, his, watch himself. Because if he ticks me off, he'll see what meek is not. <laughs> um, I'm quiet, I, I'm, I'm reserved, generally mind my own business, but I'm not meek. I don't let people walk all over me. And I don't let people walk all over folks that I care about. So humility means to understand our real situation and to behave accordingly. So if we understand that as a tiny atom of consciousness that our real, our real position, our real life is in serving the source of consciousness. And if we understand that um, you know, as folks who want to cultivate love of God, um, our best chance is to figure out how to fit in with some society of people who are also trying to cultivate love for God. That's humility. But it doesn't mean meekness and it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to um, uh, let people walk all over you. There's a, a passage in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. Someone says, uh, my dear sir, putting a straw between my teeth this in Bengal, this is a, uh, a sign of utter humility, putting a straw from the ground in between your teeth, and then you fall down at a person's feet, and you would implore them to do something. So, my dear sir, putting a straw between my teeth, um, I'm falling at your feet, and I'm, I'm begging you to give up your foolish ideas and open yourself to the 
mercy of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and some one of the devotees. I was on a walk with Srila Prabhupada in Hawaii and someone mentioned this verse and, and one devotee said, it is a very humble approach. And Prabhupada said, it is a humble approach for giving a slap. So, um, so sometimes humility means being bold, standing your ground, and you know, being strong. And sometimes it means being soft and bending. We have to be able to read the situation, understand what's appropriate. Does that help? I think we're getting signals. Is, is there anything else at all? I don't think the kids will tolerate this anymore. Thank you all very much for your patience. And